Hi, I'm Dr. Patricia Beddoes. I'm an Associate Professor of Instruction at Northwestern University in Evanston. And we are here at Under the Jungle in Shpuha, Quintana Roo, doing unbelievable underwater cave science. This is Science Week. This karst system, which means it's been dissolved out and has underground river systems in it, is a particularly excellent natural laboratory. And because it's so well developed, we can get through all of the fresh water, and then underneath there's salt water. So the mixing of the two is really what carves out the caves. The halocline is so cool. So it's where the fresh water meets the salt water is just so trippy. It's, um, it's a little bit like if you drop mineral oil maybe in water and then stir it and then it's this trippy mix of stuff. We're doing science in support of two PhD projects. At the same time we're also working with a group of highly experienced and capable cave divers but they're learning too. And so collectively, all of us together have been learning all the way across the whole spectrum. It's, it's an enormous amount of fun. Yeah, it's a great time actually, having a really good time performing this work and I hope to get other people involved to join us and get more people doing this. I think shortly we're gonna know more about this world that we live in because of this effort. Uh, my name is Matt Selensky. I'm a PhD student at Northwestern University where I am studying geomicrobiology. Geomicrobiology is the study of how microbes affect their environment and how their environment in turn affects them. I'm interested in microbes called extremophiles, which are microbes that live in an environment that we humans might find extreme, but they would find completely normal. We consider caves to be extreme environments because there's no sunlight. When you look at the ecology of a normal environment, the sun is always the main source of energy, but that's not the case in caves. And so we're trying to understand how these microbes in these caves gain their energy if they're not getting it from the sun. We think maybe Hydrogen sulfide could be an energy source. There are a lot of caves throughout this region that have high levels of hydrogen sulfide. And we think that those microbes might actually basically breathe the hydrogen sulfide in a way that we breathe oxygen to liberate energy from it. So the scientists in charge figure out where in the cave and how deep they want us to make the samples. So generally we have two tubes of science where we carry three of these bottles per tube. It hangs out like a stage. Sampling one liter water samples in glass bottles. I gotta tell you the idea of bringing six glass water bottles underground into a cave for water sampling is actually really quite monumental. The way it works, uh, the water has to come from a certain spot in a cave where we take in the sample. So we have to first um, flood the water, the bottle with the water so that we can actually carry them, otherwise they would float away from us because they'd be super positive. And then we empty them out once we get to the space in the depths. <laughs> well, okay. I get what? So we empty them out with this bubble maker. It makes bubble. It's attached to the LPI hose on the tank. We uh, blow the air into the bottle. Then we actually have to release the air just to make sure we captured the right water. And then we blow the air again, which is a bit of a buoyancy change because this thing is going to swing about three pound positives once it's full of air and then it's going to go the other way once it's full of water. And then at the target depths, we'll have depths in meters set up on our computers, we uh, flip the bottles the other way around, it fills up with water, close up the cap, and uh, in one of the tubes of science it goes. And we have to do that six times. <laughs> they then bring it back to our makeshift lab here at the dive shop, where we filter it with special filters that can collect microbes on it. And so I will then take that filter and bring it back to the lab at Northwestern and extract the DNA, and that will tell me which types of microbes are there. 
the most amazing sample set and powerful science is literally going into the bag and going forward to the highest cutting edge analytical uh, facilities. Anytime you get the chance to uh, blow the bubbles underwater for science, <laughs> it's, it's enormous amount of fun. And yeah, it's technically difficult because you have to be the scientist who wants you, if she wants 16 meters, she wants you to be as close to 16 meters as you can be as the water is filling up. So it is pretty challenging, difficult, but it's also a lot of fun. My name is Karen DeFranco, and I am a geochemistry PhD student at Northwestern University. The cave divers are taking water samples for me from deep in the caves. They are also carrying analytical devices called hydrolabs with them during the dives. We are taking a hydrolab that has been provided by us by Northwestern into the cenote so that we can take pressure, time, depth, salinity, pH, and dissolved oxygen measurements for them to analyze the water and determine if anything is happening as we check it again further and further into the future. So immediately when we arrive at the cenote, we take the hydrolab out of its protective tube and we have to assemble, disassemble the protective cap which holds a pH neutral solution in it that protects the sensors. We immediately put on a protective cap. When we put the protective cap on, we can now set it down and store our pH neutral solution so that we have it for later use. From there, we immediately bring it down to the water and store it in a safe location in the shade where it can't receive any damage or harm from passerbys or other people in the cenote or from us as we're loading and unloading into the water. So as we enter the cave, we're profiling the cave, deciding spots that we like that might give good results. The best results usually come from a very high point to a very low point in a set distance. So we're looking to get the probe as high as we can and as low as we can as we proceed into the cave. After we decide we want a certain point and identify that point, we then return to that point and take our measurement. We take the hydrolab out, take the hydrolab to the highest point at which we record the depth and the time. So as we drop it two centimeters per second, we're making sure that we're holding the probe into the upstream side to make sure that we have fresh water flow and we aren't doing anything that we've contaminated as divers. As we proceed to the bottom, we choose the lowest point that we can find we record the ending depth and the ending time and where on the line we were at that time so that we can return to that spot to take samples at a later date. It is very difficult. It takes a lot of lung control and focus, especially because you're holding the probe as high as you can in one hand and performing buoyancy corrections with your lungs and your BC as you slowly drop as slow as you can to get the best samples that you can for the scientists. My study involves the analysis of two naturally occurring elements. The first is strontium, which has a variety of types or isotopes and is naturally found in limestone. Different types of strontium are found in different regions of the Yucatan's bedrock. Rainwater dissolves the limestone as it enters the caves, taking the strontium from the rocks with it. By analyzing the types of strontium we find in the groundwater, we can see where the water came from, where the limestone is dissolving, and where the caves are forming. If it turns out that a lot of the water is getting into the system really far inland, and that's where most of the dissolution is happening. It means that these caves all along the coastline are actually really much, much older than we thought they ever were. So we've been doing um, some survey because we want to be able to know where our instruments are in relation to the entrances of the caves. So the very first thing that we need to do when we're starting these projects with the mapping is we need to have a specific GPS point. So we have to determine where we're able to bring the line up out of the water and have a clear shot for GPS. Um, so once we've determined that, we get as close as we can, and then we're going to be running our line from there. Normally, uh, one might do a hand survey, but that is on its own pretty task loading and time consuming. And we've already got all of these other things that we're doing. So we've been using the MNEMO uh, for survey, which has been fantastic. It makes life so much easier. Um, it's a device that we're able to put on the line and it has little wheels that will measure the distance once it's clipped in. 
and the innards also track the depth and the direction that we're going. So it makes survey so much easier. The LEDs are flashing red and blue to let you know that it's taking the information as you go along. And then when you need to uh, pause because you come to a tie-off, you hit the button again. It calculates, saves the shot, you unclip it, and then you move to the other side of the tie-off, clip it back on, hit a button, off you go. At the end of the day, you plug it into your computer, which charges it as well, and you get to upload it to Arianas, which is a software program. And it's seamless. It uploads the data into that. You're able to um, see it on a map. And we're able to overlay that onto Google Earth and pin it exactly as to where it is, um, like in the scheme of the whole world, which is pretty fantastic. My history in the area goes back to 1996 when I first came down with Dr. Elba Escobar from UNAM in Mexico City and I became fascinated with the area with the underwater caves and how these water filled underground river systems function and are pushed around by the climate, by the sea and then they're also really dynamic inside because they dissolve out and they change over time geologically but they're really really powerful and meaningful because they're a vast water supply and people are heavily relying on them whether it's the Philippines or the Bahamas or Bermuda or Florida 25 percent of the world's population is dependent on water supplies from systems like this one <laughs> 